In 1870, the year of incorporation of Greenville as a town of 890 population, there were already 25 to 30 Jewish families here in Greenville. This group organized a congregation and secured the services of Rabbi Charles Rottweiser of Memphis, Tennessee. And in 1873, he confirmed five pupils and served the group until 1879. Then on December 13, 1880, the group was granted a charter incorporating the organization as Hebrew Union Congregation. In 1881, the first temple was built and Rabbi Joseph Bogan became the first rabbi of the Hebrew Union Congregation. Well, this uh, sanctuary was actually constructed in uh, 1905 and completed in October of 1906. And, uh, before the sanctuary, before this sanctuary, there is a, was an existing one on this lot that was moved. This one was started construction in 05 and then 06. We opened up, and uh, I think what's amazing about this structure is that not that it's just lasted for 115, 120 years, but that it's in good shape as it is, and it's built as great as it was. Uh, Considering the fact that this sanctuary and the assembly hall back there, and this whole structure was built at a total cost of $30,000. And that included the pipe organ that's upstairs there. The pipe organ is actually older than the sanctuary. But uh, what's interesting, it cost $30,000 to build this whole structure. And some 10 years ago, the organ went out on us and we had to send out for repairs and these people came in and inspected it and said we got to fix it we can fix it we said how much and it said thirty thousand dollars so to repair the organ costs more than the whole structure cost to build isn't that interesting <laughs> at any point let's get serious here these Jews started moving into Greenville soon after the Civil War and they were all looking for a place to land, to make a living, and they chose Greenville because the Mississippi Delta was probably, before the Civil War, one of the richest areas in the United States because of cotton. And cotton was coming back and they wanted to be part of this economy and they came here as peddlers and they peddled all through the uh, Mississippi Delta Finally, uh, coming back into Greenville, making enough money to eventually open up a storefront on Washington Avenue, and eventually having their own stores. And uh, there were many, many stores in our congregation here eventually, by about 1965, 1970, was the largest congregation in the state of Mississippi with uh, about 200 members. So while Greenville is typical in the story of the, the development of its Jewish community, the prominence of its Jewish community, the integration in many ways of its community with the general sort of white social and, and civic worlds of the town. Uh, it also typifies some of the stories of Jewish decline in the small town south. By the time that Greenville's Jewish population peaks in the late 1960s, there are already a series of changes underway that are going to lead to a smaller Jewish community that are going to lead to uh, people leaving Greenville for places where they have different sorts of opportunities, both economically and culturally. So one big change is that there are fewer folks employed on farms in the area around Greenville. There is the Great Migration leading African American workers away from the Delta in the early 20th century, seeking out uh, more secure employment, seeking out more civic rights, seeking out a better quality of life, often in northern cities. There's also the mechanization of agriculture that really takes off in the 1940s, and that as well decreases the need for labor on the farms around Greenville and takes away some of the customer base, especially for those Jewish stores that catered to a more working class clientele, especially an African American clientele. So population decline generally takes away demand for some of these Jewish stores that in some cases were the backbone of, of Jewish life in these small towns. And over a series of decades, you see stores close. They start to experience more competition from large box stores in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and of course, in recent years, 
uh, you know, whatever is left of, of this sort of small town Jewish retail also has to compete with, with online services. So in Greenville and elsewhere, there's a decline in the Jewish population because there's not as much need for these uh, family businesses that used to be really the heart and soul of, of Jewish life in some ways. Uh, the other, of course, big thing is that as business folks became successful, uh, as they sent their kids to college, those kids often didn't want to return. They didn't want to return to stores uh, if they had, say, promising careers in the professions available to them. They might have married people from elsewhere and gone to live in those communities. They may also have wanted a larger Jewish community or different cultural opportunities than were available uh, in the Delta. And so they re relocated to other cities. And so over the course of the late 20th century, you see a decline in Greenville's Jewish population uh, as you see declines in the towns of comparable cities uh, in Mississippi as well as across the state. Despite that, we can look at Greenville as a place where a small population of, of Jews really do a nice job of holding on to their traditions, right? Continuing to run Deli Day, now with the help of a lot of their non-Jewish friends, continuing to make sure that they have uh, religious education for those Jewish children that are in town or are in the area, and continuing to hold regular services, right? Now with uh, the service of, of a part-time rabbi who comes up from Jackson. So in all these ways, Greenville is really typical, typical of sort of these uh, you know, mercantile foundations, typical of a level of success and integration, and typical of uh, a story of decline, but also one of, of resilience and perseverance. So that's just a little peek into sort of Greenville's Jewish history and how it fits into other stories of Jewish life in the South. Um, I hope everyone enjoys uh, this Hanukkah celebration. Thanks. One of the most interesting features of our sanctuary are these beautiful stained glass windows. Many people have even thought these were Tiffany glass windows. But after further investigation, we did find out that these windows were manufactured in St. Louis, Missouri, and they were shipped down here right during the construction of our temple sometime in the middle of 1906, where they were installed and uh, definitely to this day still look magnificent. They're beautiful windows, and it's interesting that they were used as a fundraising when they were building the temple in families purchased the windows and their names of their families were inscribed on the windows. Well, I'm Richard Daddle and I'm president of the congregation. Um, but Benji did mention that the first rabbi uh, joined Greenville Congregation in 1880 and the picture of the rabbi would be right here. His name was Joseph Bogan. He stayed uh, in Greenville for 21 years. He was German. Uh, German-American, as most of the Jews were at the time, uh, until the turn of the century, and that's when the Eastern European Jews started uh, immigrating to the United States, like my family. Uh, so he stayed here till 1901. Uh, I'd like to mention, too, that uh, the first mayor of Greenville, Leopold Wazinski, up here, was the first mayor of Greenville and also Jewish. The fourth mayor of Greenville was Jacob Alexander, that Alexander Street is uh, named after, and he moved here uh, shortly after the Civil War. He was uh, German as well. Uh, came here as a peddler, opened a store, and then, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, one of the things about Joseph Bogan, though, uh, I love this letter, and we have a copy of the letter uh, that he wrote in August of 1885. It's to the governor of the state of Mississippi, and he is asking the governor to do something about the deplorable condition of the public schools. That letter is dated August of 1885. Uh, this particular room uh, deals with the families that had an impact in the Delta. Uh, for instance, like the Stein family over here. Uh, is a, uh, over here, the uh, uh, Roger Malkin, who was president of Delta Pineland. Uh, we've got Andy Lax uh, here, who was the great-grandson of Jacob Alexander, and you may know Andy Lack as being the uh, president of NBC News, before that president of Bloomberg, and also uh, before that uh, head of Sony Entertainment. But it's rich history with the, uh, the families that have been here, 
Jewish families and, and, and impact on the Delta. Uh, Mars Lewis's pictures here as well, uh, Lewis Grocery Company. So we decided to develop a room dedicated to uh, veterans of foreign wars. Uh, and I guess you would say, start with the first foreign war would be the Civil War, the North against the South. Just kidding. But anyway, uh, the, remember the first Jews were German Jews. And I'd like to talk about Colonel Storm over here that immigrated from Germany in 1856. His brother was living here and owned a grocery store. So by the time uh, Civil War started, uh, I imagine his English was, was uh, good enough to join the Confederacy. I've, by the way, I've had people say to me, uh, when I tell them that he uh, was a military veteran, and they'll say, well, which side did he fight on, the North or the South? I said, well, he was a Southerner, so he fought for the South. Uh, he survived the war, obviously, and was uh, made it to the rank of Colonel. Uh, in his obituary, he talked about that he had uh, saved the lives of his soldiers uh, because they were captured by the Yankees twice, and he kept the morale up in the concentration camps so that he uh, kept them alive. Uh, he died in, uh, eight, in 1904 and is buried about a mile and a half from here in the Jewish cemetery. German Jew, remember that. The second veteran I'd like to talk about that we know something about. By the way, there were three other uh, members of the congregation that did fight for the South during that period. But the second uh, person I'd like to mention is uh, Benjamin Kosman. He was an immigrant from Germany in 1889. Uh, he came to Greenville because he had a uh, sibling that was living here. Uh, he really didn't need to come here for economic or religious reasons. He came for adventure. Most of the people, as you know, came to this country uh, for economic reasons or religious reasons. Not this man. He was used to uh, working for his family, herding cattle from the Netherlands to Germany. Uh, his hometown was somewhere near Berlin. So he moves to Greenville and he's bored. So what does he do? He moves to Miles City, Montana. That was the Wild West. He moves there uh, in the early uh, 1890s. Uh, while he's in Mile City, he gets to know Calamity Jane, goes to work for a rancher, and he wants to learn English better, so he decides to join the Army. The Army sends him to Yellowstone National Park, where he uh, worked with the first surveyor of the roads in Yellowstone. While he's working there, he gets to know Frederick Remington and Owen Wister. He also earns a little money by uh, working outside the National Park by shooting game, animals and such. Uh, his time is over. He comes back to Greenville and is bored again. So this time, uh, the country is going to war again in Cuba. The Spanish-American War, and he re-enlists in the Army, and they send him this time to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And since he's worked for ranchers, he's been a rancher himself, that uh, they put him in charge of the train from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Tampa, Florida with a trainload of horses. He arrives safely. By the way, I know all this information about him because I've read his autobiography, which was absolutely fascinating. So he makes it to Tampa, then he joins his uh, outfit, there they invade Cuba. The outfit that he is with is Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. While he's in Cuba, he mentions that he, uh, uh, the hardships of Cuba, the rain, the mosquitoes, the diseases, uh, even though it was a short war, it was very, very tough. Uh, he survives that, and he is awarded this particular uh, uh, commission, and it is a battlefield commission for the Spanish and American War, dated 1898, and it is signed by William McKinley, who was President of the United States, and as you know, uh, was assassinated uh, shortly after 1898. Uh, 
he stays in the army through the Boxer Rebellion. After the Boxer Rebellion, he moves back to Greenville and raises a family and has a very boring life. Okay, so I'd like to go, keep in the, the Cosman family, and go over here to uh, Albert Cosman Sr., who was a uh, army officer during World War II. And then Albert's son over here was, is Al Cosman, who served in the Vietnam War. I know I'm skipping around to different uh, wars, but I'd like to stay within the family. Al was in the Green Berets, as you can recognize this uniform as a Green Beret, and he did two tours of duty uh, in Vietnam. This is a picture of uh, his camp called Khatoum at the time, which was on the Cambodian border. Uh, these are awards that Al was uh, awarded at the time, and the picture here would be Al with an uh, automatic rifle, uh, South Vietnamese, and Viet, uh, Viet Cong that Al had captured. Uh, again, Al did two tours of duty. From there, I'd like to go to war, back to World War I, and this is Mr. Feinberg, Abe Feinberg, who's a member of the congregation, his memorabilia. Uh, he was in the Army Air Corps during its infancy, as you can tell by these pictures. These are two Bibles that were issued, Jewish Bibles that were issued by the Army at the time. From World War I, I'll jump to World War II. Okay, World War II, I'd like to go to my father-in-law, Melvin Lipnick, who was in the division that liberated Dachau. It's funny because I'd like to mention now that uh, my father-in-law was a very quiet man and did not ever talk about the war as most veterans didn't. But um, he always talked about the good parts of it. Uh, he never talked about the liberation of Dachau. Uh, two pictures up here as you can see from that and I just, and no one can imagine how gruesome uh, that campaign was. Uh, this is a picture of Melvin uh, at Eagle's Nest when they um, uh, captured Eagle's Nest. And this is a picture of, uh, of a towel that was in Hitler's bathroom at Eagle's Nest and different awards uh, that were uh, presented to my father-in-law. Uh, as I mentioned, different veterans. Uh, Bernard Shapiro over here uh, during the war. Uh, veterans over here and over here on this wall. Uh, our last surviving uh, World War II veteran was uh, Buddy Stern, passed away just a couple of years ago, and he happened to be in the D-Day invasion. The uniform uh, that you saw a picture of out front was my father-in-law's uniform during World War II. Uh, I mentioned Al's uniform over here uh, during the Vietnam War, and this happens to be a, a uh, Spanish-American wore a uniform uh, worn uh, in the late 1800s. It also happens to, I'll mention this, that it happens to be made out of wool, which uh, Mr. Cosman mentioned that how terrible it was invading Cuba in July in a wool uniform. These two armbands, uh, everything in this room, by the way, is authentic. These two armbands worn by survivors uh, from the Nazi campaign in uh, Holland, and the story I'd like to mention about this, uh, we get a lot of people from the riverboats that come uh, as visitors and take an interest in what we all we have, particularly in this room. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a woman, older woman, that was standing at the door over here, and she looked at the armbands, and she started walking this way, and then she looked down at a copy of the two passports, the German passports, and in the passports it's marked Yud for Jew. Now I mentioned everything in this room is authentic except for these two passport pictures. They were copied off the internet just as a random copy. Also that Confederate flag is not authentic uh, for uh, Colonel Storm. The woman walks over here, looks at the picture and she says, oh my God, that's a picture of my husband and my brother-in-law just happened to be random, and then she went on to explain to me how he got out of Germany in 1939. He paid his way out. First he went to uh, uh, Amsterdam, tried to get out by boat through there. This is 1939, after the Nazis had taken over uh, Holland. 
and couldn't get out that way, made his way back to Germany, and uh, then made his way to uh, Barcelona, couldn't get out there, then made his way to uh, uh, Portugal, and finally made his way out there to Israel, and that's where he met his wife, who I met. Um, so, we're very proud of this room. There are lots of things in here that uh, are just really treasured by us and by everyone.